how I thought about breaking today up, because we've got an hour, is we're going to, when we start to dig into the content for today, I was thinking what would be most useful. So what we're going to do for the first 20 minutes is I'm going to walk through um, a kind of a presentation I've done before that talks about digital presence and it goes beyond just your website because the web has changed where the website is now just the portion of what people are seeing online. So I think it would be good to go there, get the broader context, then we'll jump into some Google Analytics and using the data, kind of what you guys are probably expecting. And then I'm going to open it up for some questions because I think everybody probably will have some. So um, I have a pretty hard stop right at five because I have to get to church. So I will try to leave, um, stop a few minutes early so we have time for a lot of questions and things. So also I think we're a small enough group. So if you want to interrupt or as we go, I'm fine with that because it's easier instead of trying to circle back 85 topics later so it's a lot to cover in an hour so um, quickly just a quick background on me um, like she said I'm Trevor I live in Shippensburg PA so about an hour and a half from here um, and when not running Cross and Crown um, I stay very busy because I've got three kids you can see the third one kind of took a nap on my wife's back so um, it's me and my wife Jeanette um, Anderson is the little girl who's two now and then our two boys which are um, five and six Emerson and Quentin so um, it keeps me busy outside of the work hours um, and again, also, um, what I do day in and day out is um, we started Cross and Crown Productions um, 16 years ago. Um, we started with the goal of helping nonprofits and organizations use technology. Um, we started just with clients in Chambersburg, and now we work with um, people across the nation and world like Cure International and Compassion and um, a lot of ones like that too. So um, we get to experience anywhere from small churches and things like that all the way up to some very large organizations. So it's nice to see patterns and things you can learn across the board from big to small. Um, what we do as a company, we have a team of 15. Um, we do a lot of web and branding work that probably makes up about 60% of what we do. Um, and then we do digital marketing, which is a lot of what we're co covering today, which is about 30%. Then we also do animation and video work as well. And they all work hand in hand um, as you work on marketing efforts. So. Alright, so first what we're going to talk about is when I say digital presence, what comes to mind? Is anybody willing to give a, there's no wrong answer. Social media, Social media? that's good. Website. Website. Anything else? Instagram. Instagram. Any of those. Yeah, any of those things. <laughs> Definitely. Um, the formal definition, as you can find it, is a digital presence means how you occupy, occupy excuse me, space online. Ten years ago, digital presence meant having a website. Today, we have social media, mobile, and all forms of online advertising to consider when it comes to creating digital presence. Um, and I think what's important to think about that is sometimes we get stuck on, I need to have a Facebook or I need to have a website. And it's really looking more holistically of, and we'll dive into this a little later in this, but you know, who are we trying to reach and where are they going to be and occupying that space for them. So um, when we talk about a digital presence, that's what we mean. A website is definitely a big piece of it. It's the thing you control, so it's really important. But it's also good to be at those places where the people you're trying to speak to are, like Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, places that I don't even go. So, <laughs> But Facebook is for old people is what I'm told now. So. <laughs> All right. Um, and also when we're talking about digital presence, what I like to kind of say is the digital presence is simply how your business or organization appears online. Um, so when people search for your organization online, what do they find? Do they see your website on page one? Can you find your Facebook page? You know, what are online reviews saying? Things like that. Because all of that comes into people's um, perception of who you are, what you do as an organization, um, why they should donate to you, things like that. This is just an example of, I think most of us have seen a screen like this. Um, this would be what we call a search engine result page on Google. The top search engine makes up 83% of searches are done through this um, portal. So the thing to keep in mind, again, we're just breezing through all of these topics. We can talk through a lot more, but 70% of traffic from the web goes to these three results right here. Um, if you're anywhere below those, 
is you're fighting for the other 30% of traffic. So um, it's always important. And this one is, in a, there's something called a map pack, but that's when you see the location with it. Um, usually that's your top three. If it doesn't have location base, then it will show something like this. But this is usually when you hear the word, I'm sure it's kind of a buzz term, but ser uh, search engine optimization. That's what this kind of has to do with. Um, something just to think through is when you um, work on social or search engine optimization, things like that. It doesn't just have to be your website. Your website takes up, as you see for us, one and two, but number three, Yelp, number four, Facebook, uh, the Chamber, and so on and so on. So all of those different elements make up our online presence, and they're all important because what stands out here, all of a sudden you see a review, little stars, your eyes get drawn to it. People are going to read those reviews. You know, it's important to, to consider those types of things. 73% of people say that they lose trust in brands whose business listings are inaccurate. So that's a big stat, that's a big amount of people. Um, if you only get to have a certain amount of conversations a day, you wanna make sure that those conversations are positive. So when I say business, again, organization, anything like that, think about, um, there's over, I forget the exact stat, but it's over 100 different um, directory listings that you could be in, <laughs> anywhere from like a Better Business Bureau to you know a nonprofit search, things like that. And anything from a phone number being out of date, an address being out of date, who's on your board, all of those little things can start chipping away at that trust that you have with that user who's looking for you. So it may not be, hey, I keep my website up to date. That's great, but you can't control if that's the only thing they see. You know, they might come in because of a social media post or a review or, you know, a news article, things like that. So it's really important to be looking for those things. A little trick is always just go to Google and type in, you know, your organization's name or, you know, a, a search term that people might do to find you what shows up in that result even though you can't directly control that first thing you can start trying to make decisions based off of what shows up there and oh that's out of date or you know things like that we have a client who unfortunately had a bad article written about them like 10 years ago but it still is on like the second spot on google and you know even though it's been well taken care of years ago they you know it's been there and it's something they're gonna have to continue to deal with so um, so again, one of the takeaways from this is just creating that positive first impression. Think about knowing that you know, you're not in control of where they enter, so you just want to make sure wherever they might enter, being, again, social media, reviews, directory listings are in date, um, up to date, your logo's up to date, all those types of things across the board. Here's just a I like a funny example, but here's a review left um, for, a, I think, an inn or a bed and breakfast. Looks like a building from Chernobyl on the outside and doesn't get better from this. So again, people are going to get their first impression by whatever's there. You, Their stats are now that an online review is trusted basically the same as an in-person review. So if I go and tell you this restaurant's excellent and you also read online, you're going to have about the same trust value in both of those things. So even though you're an organization out of business, people can still decide to write whatever they want about you, good or bad. Um, it's always good to be monitoring those types of things. It's always good to be proactive. I always tell any clients that try to get people who are very happy with your organization, whether it be donors, members, anything like that, write a good review, you know, set that positive tone and don't look reactionary in case somebody disgruntled decides to write something um, and then you look reactionary to it or getting you know, positive reviews after that. So even though it's an organization, people still can write, hey, this, these people are really impacting the community, you know, really excited about what they're doing, things like that. Again, still fits um, what you guys are doing. Okay. Absolutely. So at uh, the nonprofit I worked at before, we had a big conversation about whether or not it was okay for board members mm -hmm. to pull these directories and things like that. Mm -hmm. There's two different schools of thought for that. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. say they achieve all the goals of their mission, mm -hmm. she said they have a mission, that kind of thing. So I think you could position, I think you want to show honesty with that. So I think you'd say, I serve on the board and I do this because X, Y, Z, you know what I mean? And, right. and I think then you're not trying to, you, what you probably wouldn't want to do is, I am Susie Q, blah, blah, blah. They're so amazing. You click around, you find out they're on the board. Well, of course they think they're great, you know. But if you disclose that up front, then they don't feel like you're trying to mislead them into thinking that kind of thing. So, uh, 
I, I think so. I mean, I would just say, hey, it's, it, you know, I like seeing the impact this organization does. That's why I'm involved, blah, blah, blah. You know, I think if you're presenting it as an honest type of feedback in that way, and, and you just don't want anybody ever to feel like that bait and switch kind of feel like, I did this, and even if it was meant in the right way, you know, um, I, I think any review, I think for us, we don't have any employees who did it just because they haven't and we didn't force it. But I think, again, because of a lot of people who you serve, they might not necessarily write something. So it's going to have to end up being more of supporters and things like that. And actually, when they do write, it's almost always negative. Yeah, well, and that's the. <laughs> yes. No, I'm, yeah. Because that's the thing with nonprofits or businesses, anything, it's people are way more likely to. To put something negative than positive, which is sad, but the truth. So, all right. So, according to Forbes, most people from a first impression form a first impression um, within the first seven seconds. So, today, most people will search for a business or an organization online first before driving to that organization's location. What kind of impression will you leave with them? So, again, just reinforcing that point that um, you, most people will business, organization, church, anything do that first searching online, um, and they will find you know any article, any social media post, all those types of things. So just thinking about keeping that consistency of message across as you're doing that. Um, one of the tools, and again, just as we're talking about it, we use a tool called Sign Up, which really is helpful with, um, it is a paid service, you do have to put some money, they may have a nonprofit rate, so it's worth looking into, but you can update the information there, and then it uh, propagates it out to all the different directories and things like that. So you can hook up your Facebook to it, your um, Google My Business page, and it, like tons of other directories you didn't even know existed, yellow pages and decks and all this kind of stuff. So that's a great place without having to go manually looking for every little location to be able to go put it in. You know, it's good to do at least once a year. Again, our hours accurate, our address accurate is your logo, photos, all those kind of things. Um, a lot of them do allow you to do photos now um, it's always good to showcase as much as you can and you guys probably know this from just marketing in general but people like to see people and they they will resonate with that so any faces you can show things like that will always resonate more than a picture of a building or a sign or anything like that um, and more gravitate towards that so again, we'll, we'll kind of breeze through this a little bit, but we're just talking a little bit about establishing your brand online and how that kind of relates Without a distinct and exciting brand, your organization is just a small fish floating through the huge pond that is the internet. Uh, creating coherent, appealing characterization of your organization can make you stand out from the competitors that are always flooding your potential followers. So again, in nonprofit space, it's always hard to say competitors because again, if you're doing good, but there are other people, lack of a better word, working to get the same market share of donors or things like that. So you just want to think about, there's always a lot of other messages out there and the more, if I could keep saying one thing over consistency of what you put out there you know Bridge of Hope has been doing a great job the last couple of years of putting the same color scheme out there the same type of iconography and those types of things that it sets that tone that um, can be um, you know you see that and you think oh that's Bridge of Hope or you see something you think oh that's you know Chick-fil-a things like that um, that's what you want to do with your organization and not everybody you know the smaller you are might not feel like it matters but it really does um, just to have that consistency in colors fonts all those types of things um, again just to reinforce the thing if you did this is a quick search of nonprofits in Lancaster County you know all of a sudden this is what they have to judge if they're just saying hey I want to see who does this or who what are some of the nonprofits around this is what people have to choose off of so the big things that stand out are things like reviews or is this information up to date is it open you know all those types of things and it's quick to you know to get lost in that um, amount of data and that type of thing so just making sure you can do as much as possible to have yours up to date um, Again, if this was a one, all of a sudden people would be wanting to click, why is that a one or why is this a three? You know, it doesn't mean it's bad. It just means, you know, it's the kind of feedback that they got. Sure. So when you search like that, mm -hmm. how does it bring it up? What's the order there? Is it based on reviews? <laughs> the beauty, and that's why search engine optimization companies are in business, is it changes. Google does, I forget the current stat, I should look that up, but it's like over 
130 updates a year and their goal is you have to think their goal as a business is to monetize searching so what they want to do is they want to um, a get you to use Google AdWords or you know that kind of thing but secondly they say the goal is to get you the most um, credible information for whatever you're searching so because of that they use a big factor of what kind of on-site keywords you're using so things like um, you know uh, nonprofit, Lancaster, those types of things. And then it also looks at what links are linking to you. So there's something called domain authority and that's a zero to 100 system. The higher domain authority, the more clout that it has. Um, so more higher traffic sites and things like that. Linking to you shows that you have more valuable content, how active you are on social media. It's all these factors. How often you update your website? Is it mobile friendly? Does it have a secure socket layer? Um, what you know, what does it look like? Um, load speed is huge now that's something they've been focusing on the last year is you know how quickly the site loads all that kind of stuff so all of those factors together is how they decide who goes where and formula. yes it's a formula and it changes so as soon as you you can think you made it and then all of a sudden yeah. it goes all around so all right so one of the things when thinking about and i kind of referenced this earlier when we were starting but one of the important things to start is define your audience so think about who you're trying to speak to um, and reach with your website or, or your presence as a whole um, a lot of times for nonprofits, that's definitely at least two groups of the people that you're serving um, or people who are going to lead you to people are serving and potential donors that kind of thing supporters so it's okay to have you know a few of those the more defined and narrow you can make those audiences the more specific you can be if our audience is everyone it's not going to be as easy to define where that is but if I know that you know my audience as bridge of hope um, you know a lot of times you can make the assumption it's going to be a little more heavily female you know those types of things then you can decide well based off of the stats social media like Facebook Instagram are going to be a, a more place where they are when we're dealing with a company or somebody who's doing a lot of business to business sales Facebook and those things aren't really what it is a lot of times you go towards like a LinkedIn or something like that so once you can start thinking through things um, about who your audience is then you can start deciding where you should be and where you can focus more of your energy because as much as I'm sure all we have time to do is the website and things in this room but um, there's a lot of other things so the more time you can decide hey I want to put most of my energy into Instagram or most of my energy into Facebook you can do a better job of that that type of thing so think about uh, who you want to appeal to and craft the tone and image based on that target audience. Most importantly, keep your brand consistent across all platforms to increase both trust and awareness. So when I talk about tone, that's how you present themselves. Um, you guys have probably, if you follow the news at all, have seen a little bit of the whole Popeye's chicken, you know, sandwich with Chick-fil-A. Has anybody? okay like part of the whole news if you especially I'm intrigued by marketing stuff so I read about that but you know Popeyes really came out as a winner in that because they were talking about their chicken sandwich so much that Chick-fil-a actually talked about them on their own social media provided more traffic people wanted to see you know so it created this ongoing thing about who had the best chicken sandwich that's all what they call free media because they're not paying for that advertising it's newspapers and social media and tweets all talking about their brand and you know so much that Popeye sold out their chicken sandwich so <laughs> still I still don't think they're in if last I heard so um, those are what I mean and but the funny thing with it is they've they were able to do it in a way that was kind of a playful mentality and those kind of things come out the tone of how you write I know for Cross and Crown we're very intentional to a lot of times talk about our clients as our friends and things like that on social media and those things start to craft out in the tone of how you talk about people if if I wrote everything about our clients well that's sounds a lot more transactional than relationship based which is what we are so when you're talking about you know the people you serve online or donations and things like that just the way you refer to them or what kind of tense you use all those kind of things speak into that a lot more so be intentional and again try to be if I again say it one more time consistent across all those things so it's not well this person does it over here so they talk this way and over here we're third person you know um, the more you can have that consistent tone of messaging the best better sure so in terms of consistency I think that you want to have the same book or whatever but do you actually want to have the same post on Facebook and on Instagram it seems to me like that there's a lot of people who have both and then they're seen like 
yeah it's hard that's a the problem is we don't again we have finite time so uh, if if that is what you have uh, what we always say is look at how much time you have to do and what you can do in that time. If that is the time you have, it's probably better to be in both than not. You can't expect everybody to then follow your Instagram and your Facebook and your LinkedIn and, and know that they're going to get the same stuff. Um, if you have more time, it's definitely better to post some, you know, Instagram obviously is very image based. So that one you can post things that are a little more graphically where uh, Facebook you might do a little more, you can share articles, blogs, things like that. Um, so again, you have to look at what you can do. They actually say you're supposed to post upwards of five to six times a day, <laughs> which I think we're all thinking a month, right? A month. Um, so the more that you can just think about what's reasonable, I'll keep saying again, it's more about being consistent on social media than it is about how much you can. So a lot of our clients, if we post social media for them, we'll set a schedule. If we're going to do it, we're going to start on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we're going to do that consistently. If we can add more, um, we'll do it. Or same with like posting blog posts. There's a lot of clients, oh, I want to get these out. Let's do once a week. No, let's start with twice a month. <laughs> and then once you can do that, then add more in and you know that type of thing. Because Pete, you want to train people, oh, it's Tuesday. I'm going to see the blog today or things like that. People will start getting in a rhythm around that if you have that consistency. Um, Doesn't the content have to be good? I mean, if you start throwing things out all the time. Yeah. You, you want to think who that user is and what they're interested in. Again, you guys know social media, so I'm not trying to re-say it, but they don't, the whole thing is, do you ever like to talk to somebody who's just talking about themselves? No. You know, you want to talk about, you want them to talk about things that you care about. And then again, in business, it's, well, you can sell yourself, you know, 15% of the time type of thing. Same thing about this. Like, let's talk about matters, things that matter to the people we're trying to reach. And then you can throw in something about you in the mix, but not if, hey guys, just look at us, look at us, you know, then who wants to follow that? So. All right, so this is just a quick example. Um, this is a resort over in the Carlisle area, but just so in that consistency, again, I'm more on the visual end of things, but just that you get that same feel from their Facebook page to their website to even their signage and things like that. It's that same consistency. Even the type of photographs that they're doing, you know, it'd be a lot different here if even this one, you know, I'm, if I were to pick on this, they had a couple people sitting up on the chairs. It shows that almost that idea of, oh, I'd like to be there, join what's going on, be part of something like these other photos they have over here versus just look at this pretty house. Yeah, it's pretty, but if you can create that environment where people want to be a part of it, you know, that's why showing event pictures of all, people volunteering, all those kind of things are, are positive things um, to show the, not to play off of the whole fear of missing out, but that idea of, you know, involvement and that type of thing. So we kind of hit on this a little bit, but basically one of the goals is to establish a strategy to manage your online presence. So without a strategy, you will probably fail because it can get, it can take as much time as you give it or more than you have. So um, the needs and interests of your target audience determines the type of material you should be publishing or sharing. But to effectively manage the online presence, you need a plan that you can stick to. And regardless of who your audience is, you should always aim to post relevant and high quality content as well as priori prioritize images, video, and other visuals. So again, we kind of hit on this earlier, but think about who is going to consume the content. What would they want to read or see or watch? Um, and when I say prioritize images, video, and visuals, People love video. You know, this is a day and age where people would much rather hit a play button than read even a paragraph <laughs> anymore um, or view images and things like that. So being able to put those types of things there first um, will engage them a little bit more. Um, also, social media knows people like video, so places like Facebook will actually show your post more frequently if it is a video content or photo than just text. So using into that, I think I, this just that changes all the time, but it's like 4% of your feed. So say you have a thousand people um, who follow your Facebook page, only 4% of those will see your posts organically because of all of their goals to monetize the platform. Um, but if it's video, you know, that percentage might go up to a whopping 8% or something like that. So. Um, and then again, the more likes and shares, then it opens it up more because it sees that it's quality, people like it, and we'll show it. So, so real quick, um, again, this could, could spend a lot of time talking about it, but if you're talking about ways to implement a strategy, these are kind of the main 
kind of elements that we talk about. Number one is you're an engaging website, um, which is kind of why you're here to talk about, but having something, we always call that the hub of what you're doing, even if you're on social media or if you're on um, you know, review sites or links or anything, they're gonna probably wanna come back to that one place. Um, the other thing is you don't have control over Facebook, you don't have control. All of a sudden tomorrow Facebook could say, you can keep your page for $1,000. And all that money and effort or that you put into Facebook, if you choose not to pay them, you can't do anything about it. So it's always good to keep, you know, something that, you know, your website is yours, you know, that's something you can control. They can't change anything for you. That's the hub of everything. Second, and kind of the first thing you can do, again, without spending any money or much money is search engine optimization. So you have that website. Let's try to focus on terms that will, you know, help that website be seen more. So ways to think Think about that are like, um, and I would say this, think about it as the people you're serving, what would they type in to find it? And the analogy I like to use is, I would like to think that when people are looking for us, they're going to type in website development company or website agency. Well, if you look at the keywords people type, website people or <laughs> guy to fix my website, you know, it's not always as glamorous as insider terms that you might think it is. So um, again, not these use this in a bad way but think of like the layman like who how would they type it like i need help near me or something you know like it could be as simple as those types of things um <coughs> Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Content marketing is number three. So that's, th when I say content marketing, that can sound scary. In the very simplest form, that could just be, um, you know, posting a blog on your website or a news item, you know, once a month or once a quarter or something. But somehow doing something with some frequency to it. Again, posting a blog on your website will create fresh content. It will give you at least a post that you can post on a social media platform. Um, it will put something else to be crawled in Google and things like that. So um, the things, again, people aren't in the shape that they used to be as far as reading. They don't necessarily need 20 paragraph blog posts. They are just as happy to have a nice photo and maybe a paragraph and that literally can be your news item or your blog post. So don't let that be too scary. Yeah. Can I have a question? Sure. Going back to two. Um, so how do you incorporate that, those words, the keywords? Like, yeah. back, back in the day there would be like a little box that you put in keywords. Yeah, so I will try to quickly, I'll, I'll try to add that right before we go into Google Analytics, I'll try to walk the real quick how they, yeah, the, the, the basic form. Again, all of those things like that, there's companies spending tens of thousands of dollars on that, you know, depending on how competitive and things like that, but I'll try to walk through at least the very basic places you can do that. Um, email marketing, so, you know, you have your website, you in getting in Google, you have a blog post. Now, also building an email list is another, I call it free, you know, way that you can, you know, whether it be 25 people or a couple thousand people, a way to communicate with them, get inside their email box, get them to come back and check out what you're doing. Again, frequency is good. I would love to send more emails for us. We do it once a quarter, so four times a year. It's better than if you start to do it every week, people would start unsubscribing because, whoa, I don't want to hear from you that much. Um, but if you do it too long, they're going to be like, when did I subscribe to this? You know, <laughs> where'd these people come from? So again, look at a consistency that can be, again, you could just share your top blog post that you wrote for the content marketing. So it's a lot of stuff you can try to share between the two or the different items as well. Um, social media. So basically, again, posting, deciding what you want to spend some time on. The main ones, if you know, without knowing a specific market is, like I said, we do Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn are the ones. LinkedIn is really, a, even in a nonprofit space, is a really good one right now. They haven't changed their algorithm too much that pretty much whoever follows will see your content, unlike Instagram and Facebook. So um, again, it's free, at least post it and you never know. Plus, looking for supporters, things like that, it's a very business environment. So you might have, you know, owners of companies or, um, you know, board potential people, things like that. So again, the type of content you have to be a little more, um, the goal is to be more discretionary. People aren't posting pictures of their food on LinkedIn or anything like that. But it, it's a little more newsworthy of like, hey, here's, here's a campaign we're doing or here's a story of change that the organization has done. Um, a little more professional tone to it, but it's a definitely a good outlet for it, so. 
And then the last one, and this leads a little bit into, I heard some people talking about the Google Grant, pay-per-click, Google AdWords. Um, Google does offer what's called a Google Grant for nonprofits who they've made increasingly more strict over the last couple years that most of our clients have not pursued it unless you really put a partial time person towards it because it used to be a heyday. We had a client that would get over, because it used to be, I think it was like $5,000, but if you did that, you could increase an update and they would go up to like $10,000 a month. And we had a client who did that and they were getting all the traffic. It was a nonprofit out of Africa, but they've changed it so much that you have to change your ad so often. You have to make sure, I mean, and they only let you bid up to, I forget the current rate, but like 250 or something or $3, I can't remember, but that's pretty low in the current market. Um, some AdWords are upwards of $20 a click, things like that. So it's hard to be competitive unless you're going after what are called long tail keywords, which are, you know, it's if this is the main thing people are looking for, you're trying to hit these ones over here at lower search volumes type of thing. So um, it definitely is something, a lot of nonprofits, again, unless you have a very, um, analytical process that you're tracking am I turning that money into a donor and that type of thing it's probably not worth it people like the cure internationals that working for you know they can do that because if you can say I can spend five dollars and turn that into a hundred dollar donor that makes sense if you can't track all of that you am I just throwing away money or maybe maybe not who knows so. all right I think we're getting to the end of this part. Engage with your audience. So content is valuable, but it's not enough to just publish it. The internet and social media specifically is all about relationships. It's about engagement and connection. If you want to maintain and manage your presence, you need to foster your relationships. So some of the ways to do that are to achieve online presence effectively. You need to start and participate in conversations, comment on posts, share user-generated content. So that means if somebody shares an article, maybe a partner organization or a thought leader in the space, you can share that, add your own sentence or two above it of why you think this is worthy to share kind of thing. Um, share relevant information. Hey, this, this event's happening in town, blah, blah, blah. You know, Those are things that the people following you will find relevant and, oh, this is good. I follow this page you know I'm getting this valuable information um, show appreciation for your followers and customers or donors um, address criticisms and complaints that's always a fun one um, ask and answer questions and then infuse personality in your brand so those are kind of the checklist of when I say infuse personality that's like I talked about the Popeyes or Chick-fil-a or you know those types of things um, asking questions that can be hard you have to feel that out it doesn't work for everybody we have clients who try asking questions and you just hear crickets and then that doesn't look good either so you have to kind of you know uh, feel it out um, if that works or not um, again criticism if for some reason you do get that somebody writes something bad on Facebook they actually say the best thing is to leave it and respond to it in a way that's professional and you know that shows more and adds value than just the people who tried to delete it and cover it up and things like that again there could be situations where that's not true if they're saying things that are just you know should not be there it's definitely okay to hide or delete that kind of thing um, showing appreciation that can just be a hey thanks for following us that could be doing lack a better word a contest or you know hey we're just gonna celebrate our 500th follower you know things like that um, yeah and commenting that's super important not just on your posts like if somebody comments on you it's always great to comment back because if you post something like hey blah 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 we're glad you're here and somebody says something then that's it that's a you know missed opportunity for that um, conversation that you could have or spurring into something else and it's also really good to go comment on other people as your organization again making sure it's in the tone and um, allowed of what you want but being out there and commenting on other posts will get your name out there people will see that could link them back to your social media profile um, and LinkedIn specifically I know there's a, a new study going out they're saying you should try to aim for over 40 interactions with other people's posts a day again that seems daunting <laughs> but that could be people you follow things like that writing congratulating them you know all those types of things the more you're participating the more you're going to get out of it because um, the engagement will kind of thrive off of each other so Two quick examples, um, but again, just kind of here's a Twitter one where the, it's official, I don't like the Greek yogurt, and then they write back and they actually offer to give them a free, you know, um, 
I think free samples or something like that. So it's a way to turn something negative, you know, somebody like that into something positive. It would look totally different if they said that and just let it go. Now you have other people reading that content and they're like, yeah, I probably don't like it either or it's not worth trying, that kind of thing. And then over here, uh, Zappos, uh, you know, they're talking about how quick their order came. How did you get it so quickly? And they wrote back in a playful tone, we have ninjas, lots of ninjas who do it, you know. <laughs> Again, that doesn't work for everybody. Some people are just, like, this sounds weird. You know, why did they say that? But for certain brands, if you answer, and it doesn't always have to be just serious, it can be fun or playful and, you know, things like that. You have to think about what makes sense. And um, But the interaction, again, that's what can really thrive um, for people. All right, so diving a little bit more into so, uh, search engine optimization, one of the big things, and I, this will apply to all of you very well, but optimize for local search. So since the rise of mobile use, most everybody has something like this around. Um, the searches for near me have increased by 30% for all mobile searches that are location related. So it used to just be like, I'm looking for web designer, I'm looking for this. Now it's, you know, I'm looking for, you know, nonprofit near me. I'm looking for help near me. I'm looking, you know, volunteer opportunities near me. And that type of thing has really increased. So most search, and I think that's my next slide. Let me see. I don't remember where it was. Well, but most searches will now talk about, um, you know, that near me or a location and what they're looking for. So thinking about that as you're looking at keywords, you know, uh, some services like us, it doesn't really matter if you're local to us or not, but it's still, you know, if you're a restaurant, they're going to say, hey, I'm looking for pizza near me. I'm looking for pizza, Chambersburg, PA, Lancaster, whatever. So thinking about that, both in just search engine optimization, when we walk through the site, I'll kind of show you that a little bit of what that can look like. But just keep in mind that people are most likely looking for that. Um, as far as location and where you serve and things like that. So think about also how, you know, what areas that is. A lot of people like to say things like, oh, I serve, you know, Franklin County. Well, are people really looking for, or Lancaster County, a county, or are they gonna look for like their neighborhood and things like that? So thinking about, again, as the end user, how would they be looking for things? And how do you, how do you get to be one of the things all that magic I talked about. <laughs> I don't know, you might have not been in the room at that, but there's all these different things from the inbound links, how much you're on social media, how often you update your site, and there's an algorithm that they choose from that, who's those top three results. Oh, so that's the same. It's the same. If it's location-based, then the map shows up. They call it the map pack. If there's not a location tag to it, then the map doesn't show up, but it's still top three results type of thing. Do those words, do those words that you want to Need to be in your website somewhere? Yeah, so um, when you when I talked about, I, I think I might have used the term on-site optimization, that means that those words are in there a certain amount of times. And again, <laughs> this is where it just keeps going deeper and deeper. You can do something called over-optimization. So if you have the word, you know, um, shelter. shelter. 900 times on the website page, Google's going to say, no, they're just trying to spam us and not and not do it. But if you have it one time, well, it's not that relevant. So you're kind of narrowing into like, how much do you use it? It's also, we're in an age of technology where it knows, you know, it knows that puppies, dogs, um, you know, all those are the same type of words, synonyms, you know, all that kind of stuff that you don't have to say, like it used to be, you had to be very specific. Every version of pizza, pizza house, pizza hut, pizza, you know, like that you can think of where now it's like it can piece all that together in the background for you. Um, you can start with um, business directories that matter the most, such as Google My Business, Yelp, um, Dex, Yellow Pages, all those kind of things. Find directories and index, indexes that are relevant to your area, like your nonprofit. Um, after Google, YouTube is the second largest search engine. Um, that's a fact that I don't think a lot of people realize. So when I talked about video earlier, that's something you definitely want to make sure you're paying attention to because if they're not using Google, you know, the second most searched place is um, YouTube. So if you don't have videos there, you're not going to be found in those types of things. Um, I say add geotagging to your videos and keywords in your video title. That way search engines will begin to associate your physical um, store location or organizational location. So what that means is um, if you have a video, um, 
you know, let's say it's a bridge of hope, ch chapter name or associate name, and then, you know, put the town name in it or something like that. That will help it be found by tagging it there. And you can also do different services like, um, Instagram and places like that will also allow you to do the little hashtags, the little pound sign to something after it. It never hurts to do like, you know, Chambersburg, Lancaster, things like that, that are relevant to you because that helps people search and find you. It doesn't mean that if you put that in, it will definitely show up. It's all like, I would call it parts of the equation. Um, so. The other one, and again, when we're really just looking holistically at digital presence is the rise of voice. Um, my kids are now at the point where I got in the car one day and they say, what's its name? Because <laughs> our whole house is, hey Google, hey Alexa, hey. And then when we turn on the radio, it's like, what's its name? And you're like, oh boy. I didn't even have a computer until I was 12. So, um, so it's changing fast that, you know, this is becoming, again, another source of information. You know, people are going to come and say, you, I mean, there are places now where you can order my pizza, you know, right from your device and things like that. So you may want to ignore it, but it's going to be quickly where you have to be part of that. And um, at this point, most of our clients are doing where uh, you'll intrinsically be added to these types of things as far as the search because it uses like the Google base, but then you can do more optimization to them down the road. So most of our clients are kind of just going with what's naturally happening, but I think that will change pretty rapidly over the next year or two as these keep flooding people's homes. And I mean, even this, you can now, hey Siri, what's this? And I, again, it's everybody's a little, now mine just turned on, yeah. So, ah! So. Um, again, we won't dive deep into this, but it's just, again, looking a little bit holistically. Yeah, I'm going to beat buzz through, I think, for time's sake. Yeah. All right, so big picture, optimize your website, blog, and social media profiles. Engage in two-way communication with your customers. Like, comment, and reply to your messages and criticisms. And the power of having your brand be a powerful digital advocate for your customer or donors or associates is in your hands. All you need to do is invest some time and find the most effective resources. So just again, it's look for consistency, look for defining who that audience is. Sometimes that might just be sitting down with a group of you and I like to do I didn't talk about in this presentation but there's something called where you can create what are called personas so that's where you actually create like a potential user of your website and you can actually name them you know George George would come to our website you know and you can even start saying well, George likes to play soccer or George you know what I mean and what you're doing is adding these things around and that you can start thinking about similarities so either looking through you know current customers that you have and seeing what are those similarities between them or current donors current anything or you know trying to make some guesses of hey they all live within a 50 mile radius of here or you know those types of things and then that will help you decide you know what kind of search terms to focus on all those kind of things so all right so I'm gonna do two more things because we are down to 16 minutes um, I told you would go fast um, I want to show you I'll, I'll quickly open up a website and I will just walk through when I say search engine optimization what that looks like um, and then I will quickly walk through some Google Analytics stuff um, so here's one of our clients we work with is cure when we talk about including your keywords and things like that the most um, important place to put a keyword is in what's called your title tag which is up here um, this is where um, if there's a ranking on Google what they look at this is per page that is one of the most important places in WordPress which is probably where most of you guys are familiar with each page should have a place to update the title um, we use a plugin called like all-in-one SEO and then it has a little thing for title description which description is when you go to Google and you type in bridge of hope so right here this is called your description for the site so this is what shows up so this also you can see how it has the bolded keyword right there it's showing that um, that keyword that you search for is actually in the description of the site and it's in the actual title up here um, so you can actually on WordPress you can actually change the description for each one so you can go through and say like uh, I'm not sure what this one was top of my head but 
Um, that's where you can add keywords in there, locations, things like that. A lot of times you also have like a location up here, like us, we have like uh, web designer Chambersburg PA. That's right there, a search term that people are gonna use, that type of thing. Um, so those two places are really important. The actual domain that you use, Again, there's so many variables to it, but the age of the domain, so how long you've had it is important. .com is weighted a little higher than a .org, which is higher than a .net, which is, you know, and it goes down and down to those playful ones like .io or .co and things like that. Um, this day and age, you wanna make sure it has the little S by it. I think most people are conditioned to do that now, but that means that it's secure. Um, a lot of places are actually putting a little warning if that isn't there saying, this is unsecure really doesn't matter unless you're transmitting uh, like donation information and stuff, but it's what people are doing now. But then you also wanna look at on the site of where you place the different content. So there's, in, in we're crossing into coding territory, so I'm sorry, but there's tags in there that you can um, style things with. They're usually H1 through H6, H1 being the most um, ranked and then H6 being the lowest. So putting words inside of that, so like whatever's here is gonna help with your search engine optimization, you know, and then whatever's in your content. So if I'm trying to go after the word, um, just homelessness, you know, something like that, making sure that that word is here, making sure that that word is here, you know, that repetition without overdoing it is what it's looking for. It doesn't wanna see, uh, churches respond to homelessness because homelessness, home, you know, like then it's gonna be like, okay, now you're just trying to cheat the system. We're not gonna give you favor in, in the listings, that type of thing. Um, frequency of how often you update your content. So if you have a, a lot of our sites will have like on the homepage, an area like this or here where as you update new things, it will put it here. So Google checks your site and they're like, oh, there's new content. It's relevant. We're going to rank it higher, those types of things. Um, so even here, you know, if you have specific keywords that you're going after, making sure they're in that title here will help um, and things like that. So search, uh, I mean, I can talk for hours just on SEO itself. So I'm trying to give you the quick thing. But um, the other thing I was going to walk you through quickly has everybody used Google Analytics to any point in here or not really? A little bit. Okay, good. So I'll, I'll run in. Google Analytics is awesome. It is something Google actually still does for free. Um, so you can embed it on your site. It puts a little tracking pixel um, and then it pulls in all the data that it can find and puts it into this backend platform for you. So this will allow you to see a lot of information to the point that you might be like, scared of what it can tell from you. Um, but what this does, this is basically a dashboard view. And this right now is showing last seven days of how much traffic. So 4.3, basically 4,300 people have visited the site. Um, they have goal tracking and things like that. So you can actually see revenue and all those kind of things. It talks about where that traffic's coming from. So it's probably a little hard for you guys to read, but this says organic search, direct, which means if somebody just types in the domain, social media traffic, email campaigns, other. So you can start seeing where that breakdown, like for them, organic search is the highest one, 442 people coming from, 268 typed in the domain, 145 came from social media links, 35 from email, and so on and so forth. So what this helps you do is you can start learning more about where they're coming from. Are those things that you've been working on, posting blogs, replying to comments, is that helping? Are you getting people from there? Um, let me see this one. So if you have your site bookmarked, you go to it all the time from your bookmark, that's... It will track it as, so there's different things. Let me see if I have the terminology right. There's users and then there's sessions. Users are unique, sessions are not. So if I go and ping it right here, I just opened up the site and then I come back again, it's only gonna count me as one user because it's gonna track based off of the IP address and device and all that kind of thing. If I come back and reload it 25 times, it will count as 25 different sessions. Um, so you kind of judge those differently as far as, and, and sessions aren't bad because it could mean a user is coming back a certain number of times and we can I can show you quickly where that is but you can see how often people are returning um, you know because you want them you your goal would be that a user comes back more than once and things like that um, the other cool one is like with this one you can see how many people are actually on the website as we're speaking 
um, you can see where on the website they're actually at. So this one says there's one person at the gift of healing page, one person's at jobs, one person's at the prayer guide page, you know. So you can actually see where people are in the actual website, which is kind of cool. Um, you can see sessions of where people are actually coming from across the globe. So, um, you know, America has their highest concentration because that's where they're focusing the whole, um, a lot of their marketing and things on. But as you dig in and more on a local level, you can get down to even like county, cities, things like that. Let's see if this will let me. Find How do you get the same so you'll you'll need Google Analytics is free. So if you go to Google, um, I think it's Google.com/analytics. Um, that's where you would sign up. You'll need whoever handles your website or a web person probably to help you install the pixel it's not super hard but it's probably a little harder than so it has to be on there to get that data so if you don't have it get it installed it will start getting that data for you and then you'll have all of this if that makes sense so anybody can set that up mm -hmm. right. yep so and it's free yep so we have over, because we do any site that we launch, so we have like 400 sites that you can see all this exact type of data, but specific to them. So but you have to have permission from the webmaster. Yeah, the webmaster would either have to do it or allow you to, yeah. yeah. So does that mean that already all of our locations have the pixel loaded? I'm pretty sure because of how we would have done it, they should, yeah. So that means you should have no problem because not broken out by location. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a way to do it, but is that possible? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so anything, if you're using the official one, then what you can do is you actually have to add a user to it and then get permission, but it should, if it's a Bridge of Hope type of site, that it should. But you can see here, you can even get down to the granular level. They used to be based out of Lemoyne, so you can kind of see there's a little concentration here in Pennsylvania, things like that. But again, with the lack of time, I can't go deep, deep, but it's really interesting because you can see on this page, it talks about user sessions. You can set a time period. So like this is September 25th to October 1. You could actually say, I want to see from January 1. No, I'm done. Through, let's do half a year. Is that, I think it's, And then it will pull that up and then you can see what the high times of, you know, Wednesday, January 23rd had a lot of extra people might have sent out an email campaign that day or done a social media campaign, things like that. And then you can start looking through all those different things. How many users were on the website? How many sessions? So 121,000 unique people. How many times? So this is saying each person came back 1.4 times. So. Um, there's something down here called a bounce rate. This is a person that comes on the site and then they basically leave within a few seconds. So you want that bounce rate to be low. Um, if it's high, that means you're probably having links coming and they're expecting something that it isn't. So anytime you're doing, you know, lots of social media or things like that, you might get a higher bounce rate, things like that. Is that saying it's 64 out of, what was that percent? Percentage, yeah. So it's 64.88 percent. That's a little. That's pretty high. Um, average we normally see is in the 40s. People like to say things like down to 10 or something percent, but you don't really see that in the real world because there's going to be a lot of people that will click over and this. As much as you try not to, there's also a lot of things out there called like bots, which are not real people. It's just like computers pinging stuff, and they try to block not to have that kind of stuff show up, but it still happens. So some of that's not as good. Um, but other things just to watch. I'm trying to give you again the 10 second version, but if you go under technology. This will show you like what browser they're using to access it. Mobile is really cool because this one will actually show you what kind of device they use. So 60, where is it? 50%, 49.68% of people visit their website on a desktop. And then 46% visit it on a mobile device. So they're almost like 50-50. And then 3.9% use like an iPad or something like that. So this helps you, again, just know 
again, it helps you understand if those users are heavily mobile, then it helps you think about where to be and things like that. Um, this stat's a little high on desktops. We usually see about 60% mobile at this point. Mobile usually surpasses desktops, um, again, depending on industry and things like that. Um, but again, it's nice to be able to just see how often, and then you can also see from that how many sessions are people coming back. So, pages per session. Yeah, sorry. Looking at that, you can see the bounce rate per each thing. So desktop has a 62% bounce rate versus mobile. And then here, this one's, again, this is just all the data you can keep digging into, but this is pages per session. So how many pages are people looking at? So desktop, they're looking at 2.6 pages. On mobile, they're only looking at 1.9. So what that says is it's probably maybe a little easier to use on desktop, which is why and then here's how long they're spending on the site. So on a desktop, they're spending an average of two minutes and 22 seconds on the site. On mobile, it's one minute and 41 seconds. So you can just start judging like, you know, if they're spending more time on it, that means either something's working well, or if they're not, that means something may not be. Um, some of the other things we like to look at, uh, where is it? Behavior. So this one's fun. What this shows you is what your top pages are. So the number one top page for them is the home page, obviously. Second is Cure Kids, which is like basically their sponsorship. Number three is jobs, um, job opportunities. Um, number four is actually jobs and then board, which must be a specific uh, thing. And then the about page, get well, hospitals and things. So what you can see from that is where people are interested in. So there's places that have not put a lot of effort into their job pages, but luckily the job unemployment rate's actually very low right now. So um, some, we're seeing some of our clients spending more time on their job pages and things like that to attract candidates, things like that. Um, other things that you can look at, again, just looking at the quick thing. Where is, oh, here's behavior flow. So this one's kind of fun. It looks a little funky, probably hard to read from there, but what it basically is showing you is where people came in and then where they go from there. So it's showing that you know 30,000 people came in at the homepage and then they went to, page is this? Oh, I don't know why it's saying the homepage again, that's weird. Um, but then after that, they're going to like the get well cards, they're going to jobs, but you can see that user path. And if you see this red, that means that people are leaving that page. So it's interesting because you can start looking at, again, you have to make some assumptions off of this, but like if somebody goes and they're all leaving off of a contact page, that means, well, that's probably good. They probably got what they're looking for, made contact and left. But if you see them on like the who we are page, a ton of people leaving, then it's like, hmm, maybe the content isn't there that they're looking for. Maybe we need to add more. Maybe we need to focus a little more attention on where they go from there and creating a flow in the site and things like that. So, um, yeah. So this is very powerful. I think I showed you about 0.2% of what they track. They have things like behavior, interests, demographics. Um, this you have to turn on. A lot of even what they can track has changed recently because of there's United Kingdom has put out a big set of privacy policy stuff that allows you not to track stuff. But this one, they have it turned on. So you can see the age group. Their highest one is 25 to 34 is making up over 30% of their traffic. 18 to 24 is low and then a 65 plus crowd is only 7%. So again, you can see the breakdown of male versus female. They're skewed 60% female to 41% male, things like that. But by using this data, then you can stop guessing on some of that who your customer is because you know it by seeing it in the data and that type of thing. So, so I think that's where I'll stop today because we have one minute. But anybody have any pressing question they want to say or ask? Sure. This kind of information off of your Facebook page. There is. If you go under, if you're a business admin 
and I might not use the exact term, but I think it's like insights. It should be under there and it will show who your most frequent commenter is, what your top post is, how many likes, all that kind of stuff. And there are softwares out there that also will pull all this together and you know uh, they'll show your Google Analytics with your Instagram and your Facebook data all in one place and you can get this broad picture. So. Thank you, Trevor. Yes. Thank you. And I really appreciate your time here. This was called, well, you can use the name on your um, review as your own data. And Trevor Roberts is a speaker. And um, Trevor runs the website again. So if you have more questions, we can you know, connect with Trevor. I have cards if you want. You can definitely ask. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank I know we didn't get a much time today to talk, so. Thank you. Definitely. Yep. Thank you. <laughs>